Biography returns to the life of Soupy Sales. In 1953, when America was looking for some comic relief from the Cold War, Soupy Sales was building a firm foundation for his career in television comedy. And with yet another move, this time to WXYZ-TV in the Motor City, Detroit, Soupy would savor his first taste of real success with his show at lunchtime. Everything we did was new. Everything we did was great. Everything we did was groundbreaking. You know, we couldn't miss. So it was fun. The great thing about that show and the great thing about television in those days was, of course, most of the programming was radio shows that were converted to television, like the game show. Um, but here was a radio show, a very unique guy in radio with a great sense of humor and a great m sense of timing. It was like, it was unbelievable. It was raw, but I'll tell you one thing, it was very creative. Within a month of its premiere, Soupy's program was the number one show in Detroit. For seven frantic, fun-filled years, he took the city by storm, then successfully held it in the palm of his hand. It was good television. Exciting, exciting television. But now, nah, this was Soupy's town. He owned it lock, stock, and barrel. Wait a minute, buddy. What's that? That'll be 50 cents. 50 cents? Yeah. Well, I'll... 50 cents. I, I, I have a, a dollar here. I have a dollar. Oh, gee, thanks, buddy. See ya. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I gave you a dollar. I have, I have, I have a, a half a buck coming back. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Here you are. Everyone loved Soupy's show, but there was one small problem. Due to a sponsor's request, he had to drop the Heinz handle he'd been using as his last name. The search for an appropriate last name for Soupy was on. I came there, and for a month, I didn't have a last name. They said, be sure to stay tuned tomorrow, and Soupy would be back, and people call and say, what's his last name? They said, we don't know. There was a genius, program genius at WXYZ called John Pivel. He says, Chick Sale was a great old comedian. How about that? I said, fine, because I didn't care as long as I had a name. So they changed my name to Sales. I became Soupy Sales. The early 1950s were a pioneering era for broadcasting in America. Some have called it the golden age of television. And just as Milton Berle was defining the variety show format, Sid Caesar, sketch comedy, and Steve Allen, the talk show, at WXYZ TV in Detroit, Soupy Sales was beginning to redefine kiddie TV. All the now familiar elements were there. It was physical comedy for a physical country. A flimsy, almost fragile format. But it worked. I started doing the show in front of a plain flat. And there's only so much you can do in front of something that doesn't open or slide or that you can have access to. And when I said, I would like to have a door, that meant that I could have somebody come into the door. So it was theater of the mind. Hey, gang! And then when they opened up the door, then all of a sudden, I said, let's get a window. And then we had the window. I could use Pookie the puppet or things at the window. I want to introduce you to, well, here's a, uh, another friend of ours that you see every week. That's Pookie Hot Poop. And, uh... He loves me. Pookie was a little lion, but you didn't think of him as a you know, roaring lion. He was just very hip. You know, hi, Bobby, our gang, you're in for it today, you know. And he would sing, and he'd put on a show. He had the Pookie players. He tried to be an intellectual, you know, and he was so funny. Little Bobby has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Now that's reasonable, isn't it? <laughs> It's, it's reasonable to assume if little Bo Peep had lost her sheep, it's only natural that she would know what to find. White Fang was my favorite character. I liked White Fang because I had more freedom to do that. <coughs> Even though I was grunted. And, but the thing is, I didn't just grunt because Soupy wouldn't let me get away with that. He said, you've got to express yourself so, so that we know what you mean. So uh, I used to break him up because I was, I was a method dog.
Where's what? <laughs> you found a fly in a raisin man? <laughs> well, you bring back the fly, give me another raisin. <laughs> After a year of White Fang being the biggest and meanest dog in the United States, a friend of mine from Cleveland said, well, you got a mean dog, why don't you have a nice dog? I said, that's a great idea. And I came up with Black Tooth. Black Tooth in here. Black Tooth is the nicest dog in the United States. Hello, Black Tooth. Yeah. yeah. Don't kid. So here we had this television show, but we had this imagery of these two huge dogs represented by two paws that came into the left and right frame of the old black and white cameras, you know, with these two very distinct voices. This is trick, kids. This is the... This trick. Dead dog. Here. No, that's not a rug. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's... Don't wipe your feet off. Don't wipe your... Don't wipe... Your, no, it's not a rug. With the format of the show firmly in place, an amazing thing began to happen. I think the town literally stopped. At least every kid in the town stopped uh, for lunch with Shoopy. I mean, we were all good bird bats. And we all, we all did what we were supposed to do. And we, we watched those words of wisdom, and we did it every day, just like Soupy said. And now let's go over to the words of wisdom, and they're very important, and we want you to pay close attention to them. And they go just like this. Roses are red, and violets are... are... <laughs> uh, roses are red, and violets are... Are, are. Are, are. Are, are. Are, are. No, that's... that's uh, it's, uh... Roses are red and blots are blue. Too many goodies can spoil a meal for you. And that goes for anything right before dinner. So cut down on sweets and your appetite will be a winner. And don't forget that now, because a lot of times uh, I know how greasy The ABC is, Network candy, gave him a right? shot as the summer replacement for their hit children's show, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. It was an important step for Soupy. Not only did his amiable antics mark a major departure from the traditional kitty fare being offered by the networks, but he was beginning to capture a remarkably diverse viewing audience as well. As he was building his ratings with the Saturday morning program, Soupy was reaching out to adult viewers directly with a late night show, Soupy's On, featuring some extraordinary guests from the world of jazz. And uh, here's our other guest, uh, wonderful Earl Garner. Earl Wonderful to have you back on the show. It's been, a, it's been a few months. It was during this period of nonstop activity that Soupy's two sons were born. First Tony in 1951, and then Hunt in 1953. The pace of Soupy's production schedule was relentless. He found himself preparing and presenting 11 hours of programming every week. As a result, trouble was beginning to brew at home. Well, he was doing two shows a day, five days a week, and uh, resting the other time. You know, so we'd come home and have to be real quiet, and uh, then he'd be out uh, later in the afternoon after his nap to do the nighttime show. I was meeting myself coming and going because I was doing a late night show, and I, would, and I was getting up, I'd go home, get a couple hours of sleep, and come back and do the morning show. It cost me a lot in the end as far as my family was concerned because I spent more time working than I did with them. My brother and I didn't see much of him. He was, uh, he was working all the time, so we really didn't get a chance to interact with him very much. Yeah. Unless there were some new jokes to be told. Despite the obvious warning signs from the family, Soupy just couldn't break away from his breakneck pace. His hard work was rewarded when in 1957, ABC launched Soupy's show as their first non-cartoon Saturday morning program. Lunch with Soupy Sales has been called the fastest paced half hour on TV, the hippest kiddie show in America. It was a kid's show, but it wasn't a kid's show. It wasn't aimed at educating, educating me or teaching me anything, even though the, it was. It was aimed at a guy hanging out with me. Soupy grabbed an audience of the very young, their moms and dads, and teens. That's almost impossible to do. He uh, became everybody's uh, favorite guy at one time. I think his show always appealed uh, to people on two levels. I, I guess it's like uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, you know. Little kids can appreciate it on one level, and adults appreciate it on another level, because there was a lot of really hip humor and, uh, uh, you know, inside kind of jokes. Well, we were a kid show, but our biggest audience were adults. With a set mostly constructed from cardboard, vintage movie clips, grounds from the station's film archives, a cast of characters who were largely imaginary, and a trunk full of ancient jokes, it can be safely said that no one has managed to do more with less on television than Soupy Sales. 
even when I watch some of the shows that were taped, I, I, I'm amazed. I say, we did that? You know, I can't believe it. And we did it, as I say, with a 50 cent budget. He created this imagery, and of course, radio is the theater of the mind to begin with. So it was left up to the imagination. So I just took that a step further and broke that fourth wall in TV. And that's why I always worked so close to the camera. It was like I was right in your living room. Pierre. Pierre who? Pierre Bedbug. Who is he? He's an undercover man for the FBI. Will you? As successful as the show and its ratings were becoming in Detroit and across America, once again, it was time for another move. Packing his floppy bow tie, the puppets, and a seemingly limitless supply of dreadful one-liners, Soupy and his gang headed west to Hollywood and the big time. And I was having family problems, and I said, well, I think it's time I move on because I didn't want to be 60 or 65 one night and sit around and have a drink and say, I wonder if I could have done it in another market. I have, I have, I have a riddle for you. Oh, yeah. yeah, and you'll never get this. Yeah. Uh, what red and white and run? Run! What'd you do that for? Run, run, run. You heard it? Red. Black Tooth, I thought you said you didn't tell White Fan. Uh, 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 uh. Just like his production schedule in Detroit, Soupy was working round the clock all week long with a now predictable results. In 1960 in Los Angeles on KABC, the Soupy Sales Show emerged as the number one local hit. You'll meet all my friends, White Fang, the meanest dog in the United States, Black Tooth, the sweetest dog, and also Pookie and Hippie. And there they are right now, Pook and Hippie. Soupy had arrived. He had come a long way from his early dreams of stardom, nurtured in the movie theaters back in Huntington. Soupy Sales had become America's favorite funny man. Biography's look at the life of Soupy Sales will continue.